Um, thank you for the introduction, and I'll just get started right away. Um, I'm here to present our paper, Leaky Scatter, which is focused on low power communication. We have gained wide interest in academia and industry for a wide set of uses. We can include, but no, no way limited to, smart security, accessibility, localization, smart healthcare, and the list can go on and on and on. But the key point I want to point out from this is that this can all be enabled with backscattering. You see, backscattering is a promising candidate for low-power communication because instead of a, um, it transmitting its own, uh, generating and transmitting its own signal, it actually uses any ambient signal it receives and reflects it back uh, while embedding modulated data on it. It can help keep data um, power consumption to a minimum by actually removing all power hunting components you normally would use since any signal generation. And current backscattering devices are really good at doing this, but they don't solve a key issue. You see, backscattering in this low power communication in general has been on a rise. And just in two years alone, it's expected that the total number of low power connections we will have will be 41.2 billion. And that itself might not seem like a problem until you point out that most backscattering devices operate below, sub, uh, below six gigahertz. It means two general traits. Now, it's omnidirectional and narrowband. So in a very dense user environment where you have hundreds of devices all at once, they can actually start to interfere with each other, and without the, with the real resources itself, it's actually hard to separate each corresponding signal if you want to perform concurrent transmission. Another way of saying that, that current backscattering devices are actually limited in the number of the total users they can support. So the question is, how do we fix this? Well. One solution is trying to go towards backscattering, enabling backscattering above 100 gigahertz. And the reason such, in this case, that gigahertz means sub terahertz, is because with the wideband now available, we can make each concurrent transmission on a feasible scale on orthogonal frequency channels to help reduce the interference. And more importantly, with the directionality that will actually help that we need actually to help compensate for the path loss at these high frequencies, we can actually utilize this to help with spatial reuse with spatial separation allowing us to have real scalable and feasible um, backscatter bass network. But of course, one question would be is, how do we enable this in the first place and make this actually efficient? And for that, we established a few several key goals. Well, one, we want this in, that these communications to be highly directional, but specifically vector directive. In the case, I mean that the backscatter signal is transmitted back in the direction of the source. This is crucial because the fact that in a and because of these high frequencies, we already suffer significant path loss. But because the backscatter architecture doesn't actually amplify or regenerate the signal itself, we need to find a way to minimize that total generation as much as possible, in this case, directing it back passively. Secondly, we want this to be frequency agile so that it can work across a multiple range of sensitive frequencies. In the case here, we want to solve the narrowband issue I referred to before. We would also like this to have ultra wideband capability, and in this case, get a scale, so that they can work for any device where, this, where the bandwidth is not a limiting factor of its use. But more importantly, all of this has to be performed at zero power cost, which is um, the key problem. You see, PriorWorks has tried to ch ch solve these issues with, say, phase arrays. And phase arrays can actually create a retrojected link by conjugating the phase of any incoming signal per each radiant element. And with proper design, this can be made frequency agile and wideband. But the problem is that all these techniques typically require active components, which means they can't really be low power, especially when you consider the power you use is proportional to your frequency, which is already at 100 gigahertz. Other prior works have proposed using van auto arrays, which can provide retrospective links at zero power cost and has been demonstrated up to 28 gigahertz. But the problem is with this design is that these things are inherently narrowband because your antenna size as well as your transmission line that enable this are actually designed for a specific wavelength. And they fulfill the two key conditions of frequency, agileness, and wideband operation. As such, to solve these issues and achieve all key goals, we develop a new architecture, Leaky Scatter, the first frequency agile sub terahertz basket scatter architecture. In which case here, we create a new physical layer um, architecture based on leaky wave antennas to enable the achievement key goals here. Now, for those who are not familiar with leaky wave antennas, they are typically traveling wave structures, and they can be implemented either in CMOS or with discrete components, like with two parallel metal plates and an open slit on them. And what makes them very interesting is the fact that if you actually ex eject a signal into the waveguide itself, it will actually leak out of that slit in a very specific direction, and that direction is based on its frequency. That relationship can be found by trying to solve the phase condition between the waveguide itself 
giving us this monotonic but nonlinear relationship as you see below. This relationship is dependent on the place separation as I'll get a bit more, but I want to point out this key feature and another feature we use is to enable a backscatter architecture. And that feature is reciprocity. You see, what I mean by that is that if I use the waveguide as a transmitting antenna, as I showed before, and I put in a specific frequency, its angle of emission will be defined as earlier. But what Prosody tells us is that if I use it as a reception device, and instead I impinge the waveguide with a broadband signal, only a specific set of frequencies will actually couple in and be detected. And that, again, is also based on the, um, ang the angle of arrival. But if I want these frequencies to be the same, Reposity tells us that this angle of arrival has to be the same as the angle of emission. And we use this observation to form the vector directive link. So instead of using a single slit architecture, we use a dual slit architecture, one meant for transmission and reception, where we have one ambient signal that comes in, it depends on the waveguide at a specific angle, and assuming it's with agreement, it'll leak in and be and guide out. But we imply um, reflecting surfaces inside to direct it towards the secondary slit. And then because there's still a leaky wave antenna if it with dual slits, it will leak out. But the direction of that leak is due to reciprocity because we didn't change any of the extent of frequency or band, whatever the signal will be the same. This in turn allows the fellow electric directive link, and we can ensure that our signal, that our corresponding signal is always redirected back to the, use, um, to the user. We also know that this behavior itself is in wide frequency as are on wide band, because this can work across a large range of center frequencies and bandwidth. Well, this is mainly determined by the place separation you use of the waveguide. In this case, we use one millimeter. We can achieve frequencies well above 100 gigahertz. And though you can see that the bandwidth itself does decay as a function of angle, it is always able to achieve gigahertz scale level, something that cannot be seen before in a backscatter architecture. So as a big recap, we're able to achieve retroactivity just with the, using the reciprocal properties of the waveguide. We're able to see frequency agile and widebandness. But I want to emphasize that all of this was done at zero power cost, with no power is actually used to create these key features. As such, the only tool we use for power consumption is to actually embed data. And our idea is, is to create aperture-based ba aperture data modulation. The idea itself is that um, bas the backscatter power is that it's going to be proportional to your aperture size. That's true in any radiating element. But our idea itself is that we actually change the trajectory of the waveguide itself, which changes the effective aperture seen by these guided waves as it leaks. In short, by changing the directory of these guided waves, we can perform amplitude modulation or ASK for data modulation itself. To give you a much better illustration, here's a simulation work of that thing being in practice when we rotate, uh, we use a rotatable mirror inside the waveguide. Given all this, we can now actually scale this to multiple users. In that way, what I mean is that if we have multiple waveguides in free space and we send a perceivable pulse across, a certain set of frequencies will actually couple into the waveguide and be redirected out as we embed data on it, as we embed data with the modulated, with the, with the modulated tool. And from here, we can decode each signal separately across different frequencies, not just encode data, but also actually estimate its angle location. So we see that the corresponding set of frequency is, is correlated to that. In this case here, we can have a feasible joint communication and localization scheme in place. To test all this, we actually fabricated the leaky scatter in lab to a size of 60 millimeter by 54 millimeter. But I do want to emphasize that this was not made an idea of compactness. It can be made smaller. We use one fixed mirror inside the waveguide to direct the waveguide, but we use a men's mirror to create the, for the, to create the um, ASK. We also want to emphasize in this design that instead of using a rectangular slit as you saw um, before, we use trapezoidal slits. This itself was mainly an optimization used to increase the coupling efficiency as well as increase the directivity gains. With this structure, we were able to actually establish a retroactive link up to one meter, but because our source's low power was again more detailed with an average power of 256 nanowatts, we performed most of our measurements at closer ranges from here. In the system, for example, we assume that our system has a tunable wideband transceiver and is able to transmit signals above 100 gigahertz, and we aim them towards each different leaky scatter nodes. To simulate this, we actually use a time domain broadband system which is able to generate a short pulse with a flat response between 100 gigahertz and 400 gigahertz. 
We also, when we're not co-loading our detector and emitter together, we have two different stages. One, the emitter to put in different pinching angles, and once we put a receiver on a 2D, um, we'll take our 2D stage to provide precise movement, ang uh, angular movement across different configurations for our evaluation. From this, I'm going to show a bit few of our results. Namely, that we're able to form vector directive links um, with this architecture, mainly in this case here with our any data modulation, in which we try different pinching angles between the emitter and leaky scatter. In this case here, we move the detector on the 2D state across different angles to measure its total radiation pattern. And as you may recall, the physical angle, the frequency angle coupling relationship we talked about here implies that we'll see the maximum power at the, when the angle of emission, when the angle of emission is the same angle as um, arrival. So in the case here, when both our detector and emitter are placed in the same configuration. We can see this is true in evaluation that we see an overall good agreement between that result with an average error being at 1.9 degrees. But I do note that, that most of these errors occur at the higher angles, or you can correspond to saying the lower frequencies, maybe due to the fact that this is a have, we have lower um, output power and therefore lower SNR. We also saw this thing as frequency adds are by recording the spectral profile across angular space. But we're able to achieve a center frequency um, across 100 gigahertz itself, where we even allow to see from here that the bandwidth, again, with good agreement with our model, is able to extend up this being within gigahertz scale. Lastly, I want to emphasize that our design is that we were able to demonstrate ASK across 100 gigahertz at different frequencies up to 314 gigahertz. But I do admit that the data layer itself is pretty slow. But this limitation is not a fundamental problem of the architecture itself, but the use of a limit of our mechanical components and the acquisition rate of a broader detector itself. As such, we're doing ongoing work to help optimize this for higher modulation or higher um, order modulation schemes, and we're increasing the data rate itself by using more electrical components. In summary, I want to give our contributions out as follows: that we create a novel architecture that can nail basket above 100 gigahertz. We're able to potentially scale this to multiple uses in the frequency with frequency space that visit multiple access. And this is the first book that as you may demonstrate this. I'll leave it at that and ask any questions. Thank you.